Hi, my name is Dr. Joe Childs. I'm a board-certified chiropractic neurologist, and on this DVD today, I'm going to talk to you about ADD and ADHD. We're going to talk to you about our drug-free ADD and ADHD program that we do here in our office. We have had some incredible success with kids and teenagers that have had trouble in school, have had trouble focusing, have had trouble with impulsivity issues, have had trouble sitting still and, and getting good grades in school. In fact, the majority of the kids that come into our office, I would say at least 90% of them, uh, increase at least two letter grades with our program. And the great thing about our program is it does not involve any medications or drugs, so it's a drug-free program. So we're going to talk to you about that today. We're going to talk to you about all the things that we do in our office to make our program unique in helping these kids. Before I do that, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Again, my name is Dr. Joe Childs, board certified chiropractic neurologist. Uh, what a chiropractic neurologist is, is just like in, in medicine, you can be a specialist in medical neurology or medical orthopedics. In chiropractic, you can have continued education and become a specialist, get a diplomate in, in neurology. So I'm a board certified chiropractic neurologist. The only difference in the way we treat versus a medical neurologist is a medical neurologist is only going to treat with medications or surgery, or what we do is we treat with specific brain stimulations and metabolic care. So I'm going to talk to you about that today. Also, again, I'm a doctor of chiropractic. I'm fellowship trained in functional neurology. I'm also fellowship trained in child neurodevelopmental disorders. And I'm also trained in functional nutrition. Nutrition is very important in helping these kids. We're going to talk to you about what functional nutrition or functional medicine is. And I'm also trained in, in, in blood chemistry. I'm also trained as an exercise physiologist. Now, I want you to understand, as a chiropractor, most people think about chiropractors as doctors of only uh, the spine or doctors of pain or bones and you know, headaches and neck pain and things like that. And we do treat quite a bit of that in our office. However, as a chiropractic neurologist, as a specialist in functional neurology, we treat the brain and central nervous system and we treat it without medications, like I said before. So we're going to talk to you about this today. So now, what makes us different from every other doctor your child has seen? And I'm sure you've had your child to lots of different psychologists, lots of different doctors, um, and we're going to talk to you about what's different. So here's the deal. We treat your child's ADD and ADHD metabolically and neurologically. Okay, so we treat their brain and nervous system, but we treat them metabolically and neurologically. That's the missing link. We're going to get to the root cause. We leave no stone unturned in discovering the reason why your child has ADD or ADHD. If you're watching this DVD right now, you're watching it because either your child, your teenager has ADD or ADHD, or a friend's or a loved one's child has ADD or ADHD, or maybe you're an adult with ADD and ADHD because we do treat adults with it. In fact, ADD and ADHD, when you have it as a child, if you don't get at the underlining cause of ADD and ADHD, it's going to persist into adult, adult life. I want to go over some of the staggering statistics, some of the shocking facts about ADD and ADHD. Um, these are really, really shocking when I looked at them. Out of 100 people with ADHD, very interesting, 35 people are not going to finish high school. I mean, that's, I mean, that's one of the biggest things. I have two boys, uh, so I understand. I mean, the biggest thing you want to see is you want to see them get through high school. You want to see them get into college. You want to see them be successful in life. 35 out of 100 are not going to finish high school if they have ADD or ADHD. 25 are going to repeat at least one grade. Okay? 52 are abusing drugs or alcohol. I mean, that's a big fear for any parent. I have two boys, and, you know, I would hate to think that they would, they would have a a one in two chance of abusing drugs and alcohol if they have ADD or ADHD. Very scary. Out of 100 people with ADHD, 40 have tried alcohol and tobacco at an early age. 19 are smoking cigarettes compared to only a 10% national average. Okay, so an increase in 9% uh, in smoking. Out of 100 people with ADHD, 75 have interpersonal problems, and that's because the part of the brain that controls social uh, function and, and the, ability, the ability to be social is the right side of the brain, and these kids usually have a decreased or a delay in the right side of the brain. 20 have set fires, um, so they, they have uh, either impulsivity or an inability to understand what's dangerous at some point. Uh, 30 have engaged in theft. 25 will be expelled from school for bad conduct. Okay. Parents of children with ADHD divorce three times more often than the general population. That's a pretty staggering statistic. So having a child with ADD or ADHD that's having trouble in school can really affect your life. It can affect your marriage. In fact, if 
or when a person brings or a family brings a child with ADD and ADHD into our office, it's very important that both the mother and the father are on the same page. And even if they're divorced, it's very important. So this video needs to be watched by both parents if you're divorced. Got to be on the same page. And we're going to go, go over why you need to be on the same page to get your child better. The use of Ritalin has increased 700% since 1990. 90% of the Ritalin use is in this country. So we take 90% of the world's Ritalin. Last year, the United States wrote an estimated 20 million prescriptions for Ritalin. It's a $4 billion industry. Okay, there's a lot of money to be made in putting kids on these medications. Okay, ADD and ADHD is the leading childhood disorder in the world, and Ritalin is the most widely prescribed medication in the world for these for kids. Okay. A couple key points I want you to understand is ADHD is reversible. A lot of people think that ADHD, once you have it, it's not reversible. It's not reversible if you're not looking for the root cause of the problem. Okay? ADHD is not reversible with drugs. Drugs do not actually fix the cause of the ADHD. What they do is they mask the symptoms. Okay? Your child having trouble focusing in school, your trouble being impulsive and hyperactive and not being able to sit still and having poor social skills, they are symptoms of a poorly functioning brain and we're going to talk about that. The drugs only affect the symptoms, they're not affecting the cause and that's why they only do it temporarily. Okay? Stimulant medications, which is the, the, the medication of choice for ADD and ADHD is stimulant medications, they have side effects. Now most parents when they come into my office they'll tell me Dr. Childs, I really would not like my child to have to take the medication, but I, I, there's no choice. He, the, most parents think the only choice is medication, okay? Because the drug companies have done a very uh, strong, they've got a really big marketing uh, approach to make you think that that's all you can do. And so most parents don't want their kids on the medications because they don't like the side effects. I mean, you open up the paper and it says, hey, anorexia, insomnia. I mean, your kid needs to sleep. Weight loss, emotional liability, depression, abdominal pain because it affects their digestion, seizures, dizziness, it can cause them to have increased heart rate, mood swings, dry mouth, vision issues. Okay, these are all um, issues here. Now, in our program, we don't tell you to, go, you know, if you start a program and we accept your child uh, for our program, we don't tell you, hey, you got to get them off the drugs immediately. What we do, you know, that's, that's not my... That's not my job. As a chiropractic neurologist, it's not my job to tell you to take your child off drugs or put your child on medications. But what we do and what we find is as the child's brain starts to change through our program, and we'll explain this as we go, they'll need less and less medication. So you can go back to your medical doctor and say, hey, my child's doing so much better. Let's wean them off the medications. But again, I don't take your child off the medications. A study funded by the FDA and the National Institutes of Health researchers found a 500% increase in the risk of sudden cardiac death in kids who took stimulant drugs like Ritalin. In fact, the FDA went on to say that if you're going to put your child on Ritalin, it would be smart for a doctor to do a echocardiogram or to do an ECG to find out if your child has a chance of this sudden death syndrome. Okay, So 500% increase, pretty scary. In the last 10 years, the number of children in special education classes has increased 46.9%, even though they've cut funding for special education classes. There's more kids in special education. And this is very staggering. The methods that doctors and psychologists and behavioral specialists use to diagnose and treat these conditions have not changed in 50 years, meaning the way they diagnose ADD and ADHD. The way they diagnose it is pretty much by surveys. Surveys of the parents, what they say, how the child acts at home and how the child is acting in school, teachers' input. They don't do a full neurological exam. They don't look at their brain to find out which part of the brain is not working well or working uh, you know, improperly. They're not looking for the cause. It's basically just uh, observation. It's surveys, different things like that, and testing. All right. So it has not changed in 50 years. So Einstein once said, doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result, meaning less kids that have ADD and ADHD, is the definition of insanity. That's, that's what, it, what Einstein said. And I basically think that it's kind of insane that if things haven't changed in 50 years, something needs to change. Okay. So here's the deal. We have the functional versus the traditional diagnosis. Now the traditional diagnosis is the label that you put on your child. You know, that is uh, taking your child to a psychologist and they say, yeah, I think your child has ADD or ADHD. Now, we have to be very careful about the labels we put 
on, on, on our child. The self-esteem self of the child alone is reason to really watch out about the label. And we're very concerned about that. I don't like to label your child with ADD or ADHD or anything like that because your child is going to take that label for the rest of their life and, they're, and they're, it's going to affect the way they think about themselves. So, you know, that's the traditional diagnosis. The functional diagnosis is going to look at your child's brain. It's going to look at different parts of the brain. It's going to find out, hey, does your child have a problem with the right frontal lobe? Is it the, is it the cerebellum? Is it the uh, right orbital frontal cortex? We want to find out what area of, the, of your child's brain is not functioning well. There's three types of ADHD. In fact, they don't even call it ADD anymore. They call it type 1, type 2, and type 3 ADHD. Type 1 is purely pure con uh, poor concentration and being distractible. It's poor attention, poor focus. And it's usually a problem with the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is in the frontal lobe. Okay? That's the part of your brain that makes you not distractible. Right now, you're using your dorsolateral prefrontal cortex to listen to me. If a child's sitting in class and he's trying to listen to the teacher speak, and there is kids walking down the hallway and there's uh, the sink is dripping in the back and there's uh, snowing outside. His dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, if it's not working good, it's not going to inhibit all those other um, stimuli. Okay, And he's not able just to home in on the teacher. So it's not your kid's fault. It's because parts of their brain is not functioning well. Type 2 is impulsivity, hyperactivity, and inhibition problems. They can't withdraw from stimuli. That is the medial orbital, which is kind of on the inside of the brain, on the lower part here. It's the medial orbital frontal cortex. That part of the brain makes your child not impulsive, makes your child not hyperactive. It's tied to a part of the brain called the limbic system. The limbic system is the emotionality part of our, of our brain. And then type 3 is a combination of, of being distractible and having impulsivity. We can test with specific neurological tests to find out is your child type 1, type 2, or type 3 by doing neurological tests to find out the cause of the problem. Now the cause of these problems is due to a functional disconnection syndrome. Now what is a functional disconnection syndrome? Well, a functional disconnection syndrome basically means this. In our office, we look at both hemispheres of the brain. We can do tests to find out if the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere is functioning properly? Are they in sync with each other? A functional disconnection syndrome means that one side of the brain, let's say the right side of the brain, is out of sync with the left side of the brain. It's kind of like a weak muscle. The right side is weak and the left side is strong, or vice versa. We can look at that. We can do tests to find out if that's the case. So what happens in a functional disconnection syndrome is their child's going to have really strong uh, attributes of the left side and weak attributes of the right side. And so what will happen is the, the right side will actually be not firing or not uh, as vibrant. It's kind of like a weak muscle on one side of your body. It's like uh, if you go and you listen to an orchestra, and, and when you listen to an orchestra and you're listening to the symphony, uh, what will happen is you'll have all of these musicians, and you'll have a bunch of musicians on the right side of the stage and a bunch of musicians on the left side of the stage. Well, patients with a functional disconnection, it's kind of like a couple of the instruments on the right side are playing out of tune, they're playing out of key, and, and, and they're, they may not be playing as loud as the other instrument. And so what happens is, is, is you're listening to it and it just doesn't sound right. Well, that's what's happening in a child's brain with a functional disconnection syndrome. They're not able to function as a whole. Again, the functional disconnection syndrome, you have right brain and left brain functional disconnections. Now, what I mean by functional disconnection is all the wiring is there, it's just acting like the two hemispheres are separated. They're, they're working independently of each other. And so you've got different disorders. On the right side, you have ADHD 1, ADHD 2, ADHD 3. You have Asperger syndrome, uh, which is a really what they consider right brain autism. You have PDD NOS, which is per pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified. And then you have autism. These are all right brain problems. But the trouble is when you have autism, you've got almost the whole right side that's not functioning well. Where when you have ADD, it's only the uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. When you have ADHD type 3, it may be multiple areas. Left side is usually learning disabilities, and it's also dyslexia because that's where the language centers are. Okay, So they're the different types of functional disconnection syndromes you can have. So let's talk a little bit about the left and the right hemisphere, because if you can understand what the left hemisphere does and the right hemisphere does, then you can really understand how the brain works as a whole. So the left hemisphere is the gas pedal. It initiates thought. 
it initiates movement. Um, the right side is the brake pedal. It's going to withdraw. It's going to stop thought. It's going to stop uh, movement. And so you can see that if a child has a very strong left brain and a very weak right brain, the brake pedal is off. So you're going to have hyperactivity. You're going to have inability to focus on one thing because they're unable to withdraw from all the other things. The left side is the approach response. Again, it initiates movement. It initiates thought. It's the approach. So a child with a very hyper left brain, they're constantly moving around. They can't stop. They're focusing on things over and over and over again, but they can't focus on one thing. Where the right brain, again, is the withdrawal. It stops movement, stops thought. The left brain is going to be fine movement, details. It's the small picture of the world. So these kids are usually really good with like computers and really good with like little small parts and things like that. But where they have problems is gross motor. They're usually not as coordinated as they need to be. Not in all cases, because I have some athlete, athletic kids that also have ADD and ADHD. But... For, for a general rule, most kids with a right brain delay are going to have poor gross motor function, their posture is going to be off, things like that. Um, the left side of the brain is the what part of the brain, so again, it's the small picture, it's looking at the details in things. And then the right side is the where part of the brain, so it's the it's spatial skills, it's the ability to know where you're at in space. A lot of these kids are kind of clumsy, they walk around a corner and they may knock things over, things like that. Left hemisphere is memorization of facts. Uh, the right side of the brain is the nonverbal communication. It's the social skills. It's, be able, it's being able to read between the lines. It's eye contact. It's being able to, uh, you know, if I said to you right now, I love you. you, that doesn't sound like I love you. And you know that when I say that to you, I don't really mean that I love you based on the inflection in my voice. Well, the right brain is what picks that up. It picks up prosody where the left brain is going to basically pick up monotone. And so these kids usually have some poor social skills. They can't feel sometimes what other people are feeling and things like that. Right brain loves new stimuli, where the left brain loves routine, routine, uh, routines and sameness. It likes the same thing over and over again. That's why ADHD kids like the same foods over and over again. They'll play the same video games over and over again, because that's left brain. Uh, the left brain is also high frequency stimulation, so these kids love TV games, they love computers and things like that. And then the right brain is reading and math comprehension. See, the left brain is going to be the memorization of facts. So a lot of times parents will tell me, you know, it's so weird because back in first and second grade, my kid was so good in school and, and it, he was really, it seemed like he was going to be one of the bright kids in school. And then after that, he started really not doing so good because as school goes along, we take the simple basic... Uh, basic understanding of, of you know, numbers and facts and figures and we start moving that into uh, comprehension where you have to read and see the big picture. So the right brain is reading and math comprehension and that's why kids as they get older and older with ADD and ADHD they do poorer and poorer in school. Okay? So again that's left and right hemisphere. So uh, functional disconnection syndrome again kids with a functional disconnection syndrome between the left and right brain they're not going to feel or think the same. They don't think the same as other kids. They don't feel the same. They feel disconnected from their body because their brain's not firing as good as it needs to fire. They feel disconnected socially and emotionally. They're going to show unusual behavior. They're going to feel uh, impulsive. They may have tantrums, things like that. When the brain's out of balance, they're going to love TV games. They're going to love video games. They're going to love things that are the same. They like routines. Same thing over and over again. Eat the same foods, that type of thing. They'll have sensory problems, which means they may not like loud sounds or they don't like to be touched and things like that. They have poor body awareness. Their spatial skills are not so good. They're going to have poor gross and fine motor skills. Again, fine motor and fine motor and, and, their, and their gross motor skills won't be good depending upon if it's a left or right brain. They're going to have persistent primitive reflexes. Now, when you have a baby, what will happen is you're going to take them to a pediatrician. What the pediatrician is going to do is they're going to test their primitive reflexes. They'll kind of tickle the bottom of their foot to see if their toe sticks up. They're going to kind of move their head to see if their arms move with their head. They're going to kind of stroke their back and see if they kind of bend this way. These are primitive reflexes. These are there so the baby survives. In fact, the, uh, it's called a gallant reflex. When, they, when you tickle your child's back, they bend this way and they bend this way. That was there so the child can get out of the birth canal. As they go down the vaginal wall, it, it rubs against their back and that's how they get out of the birth canal. 
Uh, the Babinski is, is, a is a response that, that causes an up toe. If you turn your head like this or you roll your child over, their arms are going to move. These reflexes should be there in the first six, to, six months to one year of life. They shouldn't be there when your child is six and seven years of age. Because what happens is as the brain develops, these reflexes are diminished. And so what we'll see is a lot of these kids, when they come in, they're going to have persistent primitive reflexes. The further along they are on the spectrum, or the right brain spectrum, meaning as we get into Asperger's and, AD, and uh, autism, they have tons of these reflexes. But even kids with ADD and ADHD are going to have primitive reflexes. They're going to be left-handed and right-footed, meaning that they may use their right hand, they may use their left foot, they may have a left eye, and they may have a right ear that they use. Their dominance is all mixed up because their brain is not lateralized perfectly. They have poor eye coordination, poor social skills, verbal communication is not going to be so good. Okay, uh, They have emotional uh, reactions that are abnormal. Uh, sensory processing sim symptoms, vision, hearing, and things like that are off. They're fussy eaters, typically. Uh, they may have a rapid heartbeat and immature digestion because the brain controls digestion and controls your heart. So they may kind of get sweaty palms and things like that. So these are all things when the brain's out of balance. So here's the deal. ADHD is a neurodevelopmental disorder, meaning the brain is not developed the, perfectly the way it needs to develop. And so your child's brain, and, and even adults' brains, but your child's brain requires two things in order to function and develop properly. It needs fuel and it needs activation. Fuel is proper glucose and proper oxygen and things like that, and activation is proper stimulation. In fact, that's how a brain is developed, from stimulation, from a baby on. That's how the child develops his brain. And so the brain needs proper stimulation. And so we, that's why we do brain-based rehabilitation for activation, and fuel is getting the nutrition well. So that's why we treat kids metabolically and neurologically. Again, that's the missing link. You have to treat them metabolically because that's the fuel side. And you have to treat them neurologically because that's the activation side. Okay? So what's metabolic care? So let's talk about the metabolic side, the, the left side we'll call it. You know, we talked about left and right brain. We're going to talk about the metabolic side. Well, one thing that we do in our office is we're going to do a complete metabolic panel, complete lipid panel, CBC with auto differential. We're going to do a thyroid panel on every kid that comes in. We're going to look at their glucose. We want to see do they have hypoglycemia? Do they have uh, too much blood sugar? A lot of kids, I mean, the kids of today, we have obesity and things like that that are skyrocketing. These kids have early signs of diabetes and insulin resistance. Now, this always is the question. Dr. Childs, I've already had my uh, son to the medical doctor. His, all of his tests came back positive. Or, excuse me, came back negative. Everything was fine. Everything looked great. They're normal. So here's the deal. They're not normal, okay? Because when you go to your medical doctor, they use what's called the lab ranges. You know, when you look at your, your blood work, you have all these ranges on the right-hand side. They're lab ranges, and they are very inaccurate because the way they come up with these ranges is that they are the average of everybody in the whole country giving blood. Now, if you look at people giving blood, you've got some pretty sick people giving blood. You know, you've got people with all kinds of diseases giving blood. So we don't use the laboratory ranges. We use what's called the functional lab values. They're more sensitive. There's a tighter scale. And so what I mean by that is we can look at, let's say, blood sugar. Blood sugar, normal blood sugar should be 85 to 99, okay? Well, in, when you look at the lab ranges, normal blood sugar is 65 to 110. So if you're 110, you're only 17 points away from having diabetes. So you can, your child may be at 100, uh, 108, which is way outside the functional range, but that means they have insulin resistance. Or they may have blood sugars at 72, which is way below uh, 85, but not below 65. So they have what's called reactive hypoglycemia, which may be causing them not to be able to focus at all at school. And so that's why we have to look at that. The other thing we do is we do an adrenal stress index. We do this on kids over age 10 to 12. And uh, adrenal stress index is going to look at cortisol rhythm. It's going to look at the um, function of the, of the adrenal glands. Okay, a lot of kids have very stressed adrenal glands. We're also going to do sensitivity testing. This is absolutely essential for kids. Um, now here's what we're going to do. We're going to test them for gluten, casein, egg, soy, and yeast. Okay. The reason why we're going to test them for this is because the gluten and the casein and the egg, soy, and yeast, your child can have a genetic sensitivity to it. Not an allergy, but a sensitivity. Now gluten and all these different things, what, what that will create is it will create an autoimmune response in your child's body. And what that can do is it can really affect the brain. 
They're called food sensitivities. We're going to talk more about it. It's essential. And the reason why it's essential is because we have, due to our typical American diet, in fact, let's, let's tell you one thing. If your child comes into our office, we have to get them off of junk food. We have to get them off of the, uh, the chips and the, uh, and the chicken nuggets and the McDonald's and the, uh, all the different sodas and all that type of stuff, the Gatorades. Right? The only time you should drink Gatorade is when you're going out and exercising. But if your child is just drinking Gatorade at home, that creates big fluctuations in blood sugar. That eventually can cause what's called a leaky gut syndrome. Now this is very important because a lot of kids will have a leaky gut, especially kids with ADD and ADHD. What a leaky gut is this. Basically, you have barriers in your body. One of the barriers that we're going to talk about today is the intestinal barrier. The intestinal barrier is your barrier between the inside of your intestines and the inside of your blood or, or your blood system. Okay, and so when you eat food, the food needs to be absorbed through the intestines to get into the bloodstream. But here's the thing: it's a semi-permeable membrane. The only thing that should go through that that gut is fully digested food. It's kind of like a screen door. The only thing that should go through is air, and all the bugs should be left outside. Well, your gut is the same way. And so a child, when he eats food, Let's say he eats a protein molecule like gluten or casein. That gluten and casein needs to be broken down, and it needs to be broken down from proteins to peptides to amino acids. Okay? And so what will happen is the proteins will be broken down, the peptides, amino acids. So it's kind of like breaking it down from 50 cent pieces to quarters to dimes. The only thing that should get through your child's gut is the dimes, the fully digested amino acids. But when your child's had a lot of antibiotics, antibiotics will cause a decrease in the amount of healthy bacteria. That's called dysbiosis. When your child has that, what's going to happen is it's going to cause an increase in yeast. When you have an increase in yeast, the enzymes in the yeast will damage the gut. High levels of sugar or fluctuations in blood sugars from low glycemia to high glycemia, up and down, things like that, create stress, and that will actually damage the gut lining also. So now this gut becomes leaky. And so what will happen is the gluten will get through, instead of being an amino acid, it will get through as a peptide. When it gets through as a peptide, you have white blood cells. And these white blood cells are like looking around for anything called an antigen. An antigen could be a food, it could be bacteria, things like that. But what will happen is, is it'll it's a case of mistaken identity. What will happen is that gluten, because it's a protein, your immune system is going to, your child's immune system is going to, is going to detect that protein and it's going to attack that protein. That's called an autoimmune uh, attack. And we can test this. We can find out through a stool test if your child has gluten sensitivity, casein sensitivity, soy sensitivity, and do they have an autoimmune reaction going on in their body? Are they developing something called gluten transglutaminase, which means they have inflammation in their body? Well, you have another barrier in your brain. It's called the blood-brain barrier. And what will happen is the gluten and the casein will also cross the blood-brain barrier as gluteomorphine and, glute and caseomorphine, and that will create inflammation in your child's brain. And it will also cause an addictive nature. Getting your child off of gluten, in fact, you have to be serious about getting your child well if, if you want them to get to... Um, improve their ADD and ADHD. If they're gluten sensitive, if it comes back and the test comes back in, in levels of, of 10, so anything over 10 is gluten sensitive. If your child comes back and it says 26 or 30 or something like that, you need to get your child off of gluten. Okay, It's essential because the other thing that will happen is it gets up in your child's brain and it affects a part of their brain called the basal ganglia so they actually have addictive nature. That's why a lot of these kids love carbs and things like that. So it's essential that we do that. So a leaky gut. We can test for a leaky gut. Uh, food sensitivities. There's a whole list of things. Gluten and casein can cause irritability and occasional meltdowns, inability to focus and concentrate, impulsive actions, aggressive behavior, fatigue, bedwetting, sleep disturbances. I mean, the list goes on and on. The other thing that we need to run are immune panels. The immune panels are going to let us know, is your child autoimmune? Is your child's own immune system attacking itself, attacking its brain, causing inflammation and things like that. Now, I'm not talking about named autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and things like that. I'm talking about an underlying autoimmune problem that's affecting your child's brain and is causing some of the hyperactivity and the fo focusing issues. So we can look at the immune panels. The immune panels we run are TMB lymphocytes, cytokine panels, and natural killer cell activity. 
there's two parts of your child's immune system or two parts of anybody's immune system, Th1 and Th2. Th1 is interleukin-2 and TNF-alpha. They're called cytokines and they create inflammation. Th2 is B cells, which is interleukin-4 and interleukin-10. T cells go out and do the attacking. So if there's gluten or if there's bacteria, if there's a parasite, the T cells attack that. The B cells are memory antibodies, and what they do is they remember that particular antigen. So the next time that antigen is presented, whether it's gluten or whether it's a bacteria, the T cells know where to attack. Okay? The TH1 and the TH2 needs to be balanced. So we can test TH1 and TH2 by looking at the cytokines. If they are not balanced, kind of like left and right brain, then your child has an autoimmune problem causing the problem. Now, we also have to find out if your child has an active antigen or dis immune dysregulation. Active antigens are things like food, like gluten gets into your blood system because of a leaky gut. It's casein, it's soy, it's yeast, it's things like that. It's also parasites, it's also bacteria, viruses, mold, yeast, fungi, protozoans, chemicals, heavy metals. We have to check your child for these things. We can tell if your child is actually fighting one of these uh, antigens it, by the CD4, CD8 ratio, or what's called the helper suppressor ratio. If the helper suppressor ratio is really high, above 2.5, then we know your child has something going on that he's trying to fight. We can also tell if, if it's below 2.0, then we know that it's immune dysregulation, and that's probably due to some type of anemia your child has, or hypoglycemia, or adrenal stress, or something of that nature. We run a DNA school, uh, stool ecology. That's going to determine gut composition. It's going to let us know if there's a presence of good bacteria, pathogenic bacteria. We'll know if they have high yeast amounts, they have a parasite. Okay? Sometimes if they have a parasite, we'll have to send you back to your medical doctor to get that taken care of with a specific drug. Okay? We'll run, so we can run something called pandas. If your child has ticks or they have Tourette's, where they have uh, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, that means a part of their brain, the basal ganglia, is involved. Well, there's something called a PANDAS test, pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders associated with a past strep infection. Sometimes kids will get a strep infection, and that strep infection will create antibodies to the strep, and then what will happen is those antibodies will actually pass the blood-brain barrier and actually affect your child's part of their brain that inhibits movement. Okay, and so sometimes we can have ticks and uh, Tourette's and things like that. So we'll run that test on kids that do have ticks. Um, we can also test for H. pylori, which is a stomach infection. Inflammation, we can do C-reactive protein. Uh, we can do homocysteine because a lot of times you know, if there's an autoimmune issue, your child's going to have more inflammation than they need to have. Uh, we can test them and screen for neurotransmitters. In fact, it's a, it's a form uh, in the paperwork that you'll be getting in the mail. Uh, we can find out if your child needs dopamine support. Do they need uh, support for their any neurotransmitters like gabatone or, or acetylcholine or serotonin support? We can find that out. Uh, neurotransmitters can definitely be part of neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, what we do once we get all this together, when we look at the metabolic issue, what we'll do is we're going to come up with a specific nutritional approach for your child. It's not just some random thing here, do this, we think this is good for ADD and ADHD. No, it's specific to your child. Does your child have a leaky gut? Does your child have a gluten sensitivity, soy sensitivity, casein sensitivity? We're going to uh, make that diet specific. Do they have uh, blood sugar issues? Do we need to repair it with some of our nutraceuticals? So we're going to do specific non-drug nutritional uh, compounds that are going to help your child get healthier fatty acids, things like that, probiotics, things that are going to repair the gut. It's essential. Vitamin D, essential, things like that. Glutathione, which is a very strong uh, antioxidant. In fact, if you know anything about uh, treating kids with autism, glutathione is very hot in helping kids with autism. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a mother load, load of all antioxidants and helps protect your child. So we do that. Now the question is, has your child with ADHD had all these, uh, these tests performed? Have they had these tests performed? Probably not, right? Because most of the time, they, all they do is say, okay, let's take a look at your child. He's, he's uh, kind of looks like he's hyperactive. You think he's hyperactive at home? Okay. Label him, boom, he's ADD, ADHD. Give him drugs. That's basically all they do. They're definitely not doing these tests. The reason why is because most doctors are not trained in looking at these tests. They're not trained in looking for food sensitivities, autoimmune issues. Oh, by the way, the food sensitivities are not allergies. So if you said, well, I already had my child to the allergist, 
and everything was fine, Doc. He's not allergic to anything, or he's only allergic to my the golden retriever at home, or something like that. They're allergies. That's an IgE response. We're looking at an IgG response. IgG affects the brain. IgE, which is an allergy, IgE is an allergy. Does not affect the brain. IgG are delayed, and they affect the brain. Okay, so most doctors are not going to be testing these things. So these things need to be tested. If you're serious, I mean, this is your child's life. If you're serious about fixing the cause of the ADD and the ADHD, you need to run the tests. Okay, let's talk about the neurological treatments that we do uh, based on specific neurological testing. So we want to find out which part of your child's brain is not working right. Number one, is it left brain or is it right brain? We want to find that out. We also want to find out, is your child's frontal lobe the problem. Of the frontal lobe, is it the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex? Is it the medial orbital area? Okay, is it a medial ventral? Kids with medial ventral issues are extremely unmotivated. Tougher kids to fix, but we can fix them. Um, in the back here, we have the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe. This is smell. In the, in the back and through here, this is the occipital lobe. The cerebellum. A lot of kids with with ADD and ADHD have cerebellar issues. The cerebellum controls balance and coordinated movement. It has been studied that kids with ADD and ADHD have smaller cerebellar vermices, which is the middle of the cerebellum. If the cerebellum is not functioning well, is not as developed as it needs to be, then your child's going to have a lot of problems. The cerebellum fires to the frontal lobe, so we almost always do cerebellar rehabilitation. And then there's the brainstem. We need to look at the brainstem. So we look at all those areas with our specific neurological tests. We do a brain functional assessment. We're going to do a comprehensive questionnaire. It's like a seven-page questionnaire where we're going to look at your child metabolically and find out exactly what's going on. We're going to do interactive metronome testing. This is a specific computer testing that's going to find out, is your child impulsive? Does he have poor focus? And we'll run that test. We'll do visual and auditory reflexes. We'll check autonomic function, which we're going to check, test them to see how his digestion is. is. Does he have sweaty palms? We'll look at their gait. We'll look at their posture. Again, usually kids with ADHD will have poor posture. They'll slouch in their chair. We'll look at their muscle tone. Do they have spasticity? Do they have hypotonia, which means sort of floppy, kind of non-toned muscles? We're going to look at their balance. A lot of kids with ADD and ADHD have poor balance issues and poor coordination because the cerebellum is involved. We're going to test those primitive reflexes, the Babinski test, the Gallant test, all those tests that you should have as an infant, all those uh, uh, reflexes, but you shouldn't have as an older child. We're going to make sure that they don't have them. If they have them, we have a specific remediation to get rid of those so your child can progress. We're going to look at their motor performance. We're going to look at their heart and lungs. We're going to actually do something called video nystagmoscopy. Video nystagmoscopy means we're going to put these goggles on their eyes, and we're going to measure their eye movements. Eye movements are highly indicative of frontal lobe function and cerebellar function. We're going to be able to see, does your child's eyes move uh, properly? Do, is he able to look from one target to the other target without missing the target? That affects your child's reading. So we're going to actually do an infrared, put an infrared camera on top of your child's eyes and measure his, uh, his reading. We're going to do a spinal examination. We're going to look at the health of their spine. Cognitive evaluation, evaluation. We'll, we'll recommend specific lab tests. And uh, we're going to look at previous testing. We're going to look at the intelligence test, the Wyatt test, the Weschler achievement test, all these different things we want to look at because it all gives us an understanding of, of what part of your child's brain needs to be affected. We're going to do neurological treatments. Okay, once we find out what's not working well, we are going to try to create what's called neuroplasticity in the area of your child's brain that's weak. So again, let's say he's got a weak right brain, and let's say on that right side we find out that it's the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, so he can't focus. We determine that because his eye movements were really bad, because your eye centers are there. He also has temporal lobe problems, so he's got some, some not hearing issues, but he's real sensitive to loud sounds and things like that. So what we want to do is we want to do specific stimulations to create a more efficient area, to make that area actually change, kind of like come from a weak muscle to a strong muscle. So when you go to the gym and you exercise your arms and you eat well and you do metabolic care and you do weight training, your, your muscles grow and they get stronger, well that's the same thing. Your brain can change. It can change even when you're 90 years of age. And so we want to create what's called neuroplasticity. And we do that by doing cerebellar rehabilitation, vestibular stimulation. This is very important. Vestibular is the inner ear. A lot of kids have poor vestibular function. That's why their balance is off. We'll do a lot of balance training, which I have number three, balance training. Hemifield visual stimulation, which is basically uh, looking at uh, doing light stimulation, auditory stimulation. If you, if you put uh, 
low frequency sounds in the left ear, it's going to stimulate the right brain. Olfactory stimulation is smell. Gross motor exercises, which is essential. I'm going back to smell again. It's the only sensory uh, stimulation that doesn't cross, so we'll put smell in the right nostril. Uh, uh, smells that aren't so great, kind of unpleasant smells, really stimulate the right brain because it stimulates a withdrawal response. And so we'll do that. Interactive metronome is, is another thing that we do. And we're going to talk about that here in just a minute. That's probably one of the most important things that we do. You can go to interactivemetronome.com. We do what's called a Taylor Visograph. And what a Visograph is, is we're going to look at your child while he reads and we're going to see does his eyes track smoothly as they look at the words when he goes back to the next line? Is he passing the line, which is making your child have a, a big, tough time reading? We definitely do that when we treat kids with dyslexia, but also ADHD kids. Brain-based treatment examples, again, balance training, cross-crawl, specific kinds of balance exercises, unilateral chiropractic adjustments. Now, a lot of people will say, well, I don't know about chiropractic for my child and things like that. Well, what we do is we're going to adjust the left, all the joints on the left side of your child's body because people know that the right brain controls the left side and the, and the, le uh, the left brain controls the right side. So if we stimulate the left side of your body, that will go up to your child's frontal lobe and his cerebellum. And so we'll do that also. Now, we don't have to do cracking and popping and things like that that you think we do for kids with, uh, or adults with back and neck pain. We can use a very light, gentle instrument that kind of just sort of vibrates the spine on one side. And so they're extremely powerful. Very, very important for kids with ADD and ADHD. Interactive metronome. Let's talk about interactive metronome. Interactive metronome is a computer-based program. So your child's going to look at this computer, and it's going to train visual, motor, auditory, and what, what he's going to do is he's going to have these headphones on, and he's going to have to listen to this cowbell, and he's going to have to hit it at the exact same time. Now, it sounds easy, but what it's going to do is it's a great trainer for the right frontal lobe because they have to focus, and they have to listen, and they develop rhythm and timing. The whole time they're on there, which they'll be on there from anywhere from 5 to 20 minutes when they come into our office, they have to block everything out. So they're training that dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. It's essential. In fact, the studies on it found out that double-blind placebo-controlled study of 9 to 12-year-old boys diagnosed with ADHD found those undergoing IM treatments showed statistically significant improvements over both control groups. This is a double-blind study in attention and concentration, motor control and coordination, language processing, reading fluency, and the control of aggression and impulsivity. And this was uh, published in the American Journal of Occupational Therapy. So that's one tool, one of the many tools that we use. And just using that tool just itself can do all these things. Okay? We use our hemifield stimulation program. And so what that's going to do is it's going to use lights. It's going to use... It's going to use movement, eye movements and lights to stimulate certain parts of the brain that we're trying to get at. Now here's the deal. How are we different than other therapies? This is how we're different. Number one is we do a hemispheric-based perspective. So we're trying to aim our therapies or focus our therapies on the weak areas, not just overall stimulation. Okay. So here's the deal. Let's say uh, your child has, uh, in this case, a right brain that's firing uh, higher than the left brain. And in fact, most kids with ADHD, almost 90% of them is actually the reverse. It's the right brain that's reduced. But let's, we'll use this example. So let's say the right brain's high, the left brain's low, and let's say your child takes a stimulant medication. What that's going to do is it's going to make the whole brain fire faster. But notice what it doesn't do is it doesn't affect the discrepancy between the two hemispheres. So it's not hemispheric based. It's not fixing the cause of the problem. It's just stimulating the drug, stimulating the brain. And then when your child gets home and the, and, and the drugs wear off, then the brain goes right back down to this again. And that's the same thing with, uh, let's say, occupational therapy or biofeedback or all this stuff. What they're doing is they're just stimulating the whole brain, but they're not affecting the hemisphere. They're not doing hemispheric-based therapy. Okay? They're not getting at the cause. The other thing that we do is we look at your child's metabolic capacity. Not every child has the same neurological stamina. Now, what do I mean by that? So some kids can only do five minutes on the metronome, and their brain is, is gone too far, and, it, and it meaning that they've, they've done too much work. Because there's a point where it becomes counterproductive if we keep working a child when they're exceeding their metabolic capacity. So we have specific things that we look at. We look at the pupils in their eyes. We look at their, uh, their hands, and we look at, we just watch them. We're going to monitor for that. So we want to train them right up to metabolic capacity, but not over metabolic capacity. 
Most other doctors that are uh, treating any kids with ADD and ADHD, if they're, if they're doing anything more than drugs, they know nothing about metabolic capacity. That is a functional neurological concept. So in the office, well, typical, we'll see kids in our office two to three visits per week for the first 90 days, and then we do a reevaluation. Kids with ADD and ADHD need anywhere from three months to a year of care. Okay, now they're not going to come two to three times a week for the whole year. I may see them maybe once a week or every other week for most of the year. But in that first 90 days, we see them two to three times. You're going to be doing home therapies. Again, I'm looking for parents that are serious. This is your child's life, okay? This is their future. I mean, you saw the statistics. And I'm looking for parents that are willing to, uh, you know, crawl through ground glass to get their child well. And so home therapies are a must. And we're only going to have you do about 10 minutes of home therapies. It may be a primitive reflex remediation exercise that you need to do uh, three days a week at home. It may be uh, some, uh, some balance exercises or something like that. We're going to give you specific therapies that you're going to need to do. Uh, again, so parents must work with their children at home. Okay, let's talk about this for a second. I only accept kids who have parents that are absolutely uh, motivated. They need to be warriors for getting their child better because it's going to take time. Again, I have, both parents have to be on board also because if we find out your child's gluten and let's say you're like, well, he's gluten sensitive, but let me, uh, we'll give him some cake uh, on the weekends if he wants cake or he'll have french fries or let's say one parent's serious but the other parent when he picks him up takes him over to McDonald's and says, I'm not, really, so I'm not really buying this gluten sensitivity thing even though we've ran the test and we found that out, your child's not going to get better. So it's essential that you follow uh, the things that we say. So we're not going to accept parents unless, uh, accept kids unless their parents are extremely committed to getting well. So again, I work with other providers such as child psychologists, speech therapists, and school staff. I want you to know that. Uh, it's not like, uh, you know, we're an island here. I want to, I want to correspond back with your teachers. I want, if your child has an intelligence test or Wechsler's test or the PSSAs or something like that, I want to, I want to see that stuff. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we're working as a team to help your child. Okay, and we want to work with the medical doctor. Let's say you have your medical doctor has your child on Ritalin and your child's starting to do better. I want to work with the medical doctor because he will be the one that will potentially wean your child off. In fact, most of our kids that come into our office never need to take the medication if they never were on it in the, in the first place or they are able to get off of the medications uh, as, as time goes on. We'll work with your medical doctor there. So, results. Our program is extremely successful. Again, most kids go up about two letter grades. I had a, ch a mother the other day, she had a tear in her eye. Uh, she was so excited because her child went from D's and C's and now he's on the honor roll. So that's the kind of results we have. And the reason why is because we do our brain-based neurologic and metabolic. We've got to do both sides, neurologic and metabolic approach. And because we only accept people who we think we can help. You understand that? We only accept the kids we think we can help. And we only accept uh, the, uh, the kids who have parents that we think are going to be able to follow through with the programming and fix the true cause. A couple questions. How is your child's ADD or ADHD affecting the, re affected the relationships uh, with your family, your finances, things like that? How has it affected other activities? I mean, when you have a child with ADD and ADHD, it can be extremely stressful. And uh, so just think about that. Number two is how uh, are you worried that your child's ADD or ADHD will never resolve? See, most people think that it's never going to be fixed and they need to just keep using these medications. But there is a way that we can help kids with ADD and ADHD. We just talked about it. Are you concerned about the side effects of all the stimulant medications your child is taking? Most parents don't want their kids on the medications, but again, they think that there's no other choice. Okay? And this is very important. Do you want to address the true cause of your child's ADHD rather than masking the symptoms? I have some parents that come in and say, oh, well, I'm just fine with giving them the Ritalin, and that's no big deal. Well, we don't accept parents that are just completely fine with only using Ritalin. We want people that are actually ready to make the change in their child. They're really thinking about their child's future. And talking about your child's future, are you worried that your child's ADD or ADHD will affect their ability to get into college? or succeed in the real world after, your, after they're finished school. Now, number one, are you worried your child's going to graduate? Is it, right? That's important. Number two, I mean, I got two boys, and I want, I want them to be whatever they want to be. I want them to be able to go to college. I want them to be able to be successful in life. I'm sure you want the same thing for your child. If they have ADD and ADHD, it's going to be a lot harder for them to get through college. It's going to be a lot harder for them to get through, um, get through high school. So think about that. Are you worried about that? So our functional brain assessment. 
If you uh, have been listening to this video and you want to do something about this, and let's say you're online right now, what I recommend you do is just go down a little further on this web page and you can put in your name and information and we will send you out uh, a full written report about, about this program and we'll also give you information on how to receive a functional brain assessment for your child, your teenager, or yourself if you're an adult with ADD, ADD or ADHD and uh, we'll, send, we'll email that out to you. If you are already a patient uh, in the office, you've already had your functional brain assessment, uh, watch this DVD. Make sure that both parents watch this DVD and when you come back we will go over all the results of your child's uh, initial brain examination. So thanks a lot. Take care.